the Mongols, a proud race of nomads and hunters. Their country is a vast tract of desert, steppe and mountain, dividing Russian Siberia from China, where the 20th century has barely arrived. Seven hundred years ago, half the known world crumbled before the armies of the Mongols, the golden horde of Genghis Khan. Eventually, their empire stretched from Europe to the Pacific coast of China. The decaying civilizations of antiquity were finally put to the sword. But their power was short-lived. Today, their independence is tolerated only in a buffer state between their once subject peoples, the Russians in the north and the Chinese in the south. In this issue, Echo examines the life of a forgotten people, the Mongols. From outer space, this is the only visible evidence of man's existence on the Earth's surface. The Great Wall of China. It dwarfs every other structure of man into insignificance. Two thousand miles long, it was built to insulate civilized China from the rude hordes of Mongolia. But in the end, challenged by Genghis Khan, it proved useless. The Mongols brought the Chinese nothing but savagery. The culture they came to destroy absorbed them instead. In a century, the Golden Horde was forgotten. Its blood diluted and its savagery softened, Mongolia became a province of Imperial China. Today, the emperors have gone, but the richest and most fruitful part of old Mongolia remains a province of China. The grain that fed Genghis Khan's horde is now reaped from Mao Zedong. But this land is the key to China. She has to control it. It points like an arrow into China's heartland. This is Huihot, capital city of Inner Mongolia and the two and a half million Mongolians who live under Mao's rule. Little is known of their life here, but few would question the claim that China has transformed Huihot into a booming industrial center. The Mongols are said to be the most pampered of China's minorities, with Russia's Siberian army concentrated just across the border in Outer Mongolia, Mao, it seems, is happy to pay a high price for loyalty here. Ever since Russia and China ended their post-revolutionary honeymoon, the Mongolians have been pawns in the growing hostility of their conflict. On China's side of the border, two million must follow the thoughts of Mao. On the other side, a million Mongols must support the policies of Leonid Brezhnev. Mongolia lives under the ever-present threat of becoming a battlefield. In 1969, the Russians and Chinese fought out a full-scale battle to the east on the Usuri River. Since then, vicious border skirmishes like this, filmed by Russian cameramen, have taken place.
Across China's frontier is the vastness of the Gobi Desert, the southern half of Outer Mongolia. Officially, it's an independent country with a seat in the United Nations. But landlocked and surrounded on three sides by Russia, Outer Mongolia is totally dependent on the goodwill of Leonid Brezhnev. When the last of China's emperors fell, Outer Mongolia broke away from China, only to fall under the control of Tsarist Russia. Then, in the turmoil of the Russian Revolution, Mongolia was declared an independent country. But in the midst of a sea of red, she had little choice but to adopt Russia's communism. Today, in even the coldest winter, Ulan Bator, it translates as Red Hero, is always sure to give Brezhnev a warm welcome, and Yumshagin Sedanbal, Mongolia's leader, can be counted on to be his staunchest supporter in the communist pantheon. Today, Suhe Bator, the man who led Mongolia into independence, looks out on a city that seems a carbon copy of any one of a dozen Russian provincial capitals. Everything, cars, uniforms, lampposts and architecture, has been imported from the Soviet Union. The Russians, like the Chinese in Inner Mongolia, have pumped in vast amounts of aid money in an attempt to transform a nation of nomads into a modern proletariat state. The transformation seems far from complete. The Mongols seem more interested in Russian consumer products than the heavy trucks the Kremlin would like to see dominating the streets of Ulaanbaatar. Out on the steppes, vast cooperatives have been set up and equipped with the latest Russian machinery. Great areas of grazing land have been ploughed under and planted with seed. The results have been disastrous. The soil is too poor, and a vast dust bowl is being created in southern Mongolia. The grain harvest for the next five-year plan has had to be cut. But for the majority of Mongolians, the horse is still the prime means of power and transport. The cult of the horse is the dominating force in a man's life here. They have lived by the horse for 3,000 years. Even today, there are two horses in Mongolia for every man, woman and child. These are the world's greatest herdsmen. Their sheep and cattle number 24 million animals. The Mongols have been nomads by necessity. Home has been wherever there was grazing to be had. When it ran out, they moved on. These children learned to ride before they could walk. But today, the ways of the past are considered too inefficient. The nomads are being lured into a settled life by the promise of an easier life in the cities and on the collective farms. The party would like horse riding to become just another sport like the ritualized and complex showmanship of Mongolian wrestling. <laughs> their sports are reminders of their great past. These are the skills that gave Genghis Khan the power to conquer empires. But the bows and arrows are symbolic of Mongolia today. The points are blunted, they have lost their aggression. The Mongols are now a subject and divided people. The roads that once joined them have been cut. Two great armies glower at each other across the dividing line. The Mongols must turn to their past to sustain their identity. Thank <laughs> you. 